Thank you for joining us today um, uh, for our Q&A sessions for uh, the different compliance path for the Clean Buildings Performance Standards. So today's session will be recorded. Uh, we will try to get all, um, well, we'll try to get all or as many questions as we can before noon. So let's get started. Um, so today we have some of our clean members, uh, clean buildings team members to help us answer your questions. Unfortunately, Emily and Aaron will not be with us today. Um, let's do a quick roll call for those who are here so you could hear our voices. And uh, when I call your name, just say hello. And so I'm going to start with myself. My name is Annalyn, uh, Annalyn Bergen. Luke, say hello. Yeah, Luke Howard. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for joining us. Uh, Annika. Hi, Annika McDonald. Uh, Brittany. Hi, good morning, everybody. And Danielle. Hi, everybody. I'm Danielle. Nice uh, hello, good morning. So this is our team. Our program falls under the State Energy Office. So this slide represents our agency's purpose. Commerce touches every aspect of community and economic development. Here at Commerce, we strengthen communities. So for today's agenda, I'll just do a brief uh, recap of the Clean Buildings Performance Standards for those who are new with us. Um, we'll go over some resources available and dive right into questions submitted. They'll have priority, so please enter questions into the chat if you weren't able to submit questions when you registered. So we'll get to those questions next. If you have, uh, if your question was called and you'd like to add more information or clarification, feel free to unmute yourself and um, questions not related to the compliance path, they're okay. Um, so just go ahead and ask it. So questions, um, so question, there's some questions that require like additional research. Uh, we'll just compile those questions, we'll answer them and we'll email the answers to the group. Okay, great. So um, for those new to clean buildings, uh, I'd like to share some background information of the clean buildings performance standard. So the clean buildings law was authorized into house bill 1257 in the 2019 legislative session. The law requires covered commercial buildings over 50,000 square feet to meet green uh, to meet energy performance targets. The standards based on ASHRAE standard 100, which covers energy efficiency in existing buildings. This is the reference standard. So Commerce developed amendments to standard 100 to conform to the clean buildings legislation. These amendments can be found under WAC 19450. So you can find an integrated document on our website, and I'll be showing. Um, that to you in a little bit. So the law charged commerce with rulemaking, notifying building owners, administering incentive and supporting mandatory compliance. So the clean buildings uh, performance standard applies to tier one buildings, formerly known as covered commercial buildings. The tier one building is where the sum of non-residential hotel, motel and dormitory floors exceed 50,000 gross square feet, excluding parking garage areas. So this flow chart doesn't apply to tier two buildings if you're um, aware of tier two buildings. This flow chart gives just a general overview of the paths you can take to comply with the standard. So you, uh, if you can see the color orange, it's the orange squares are the different paths. So that's an uh, application for an exemption certificate, the investment criteria, and meeting the energy use intensity target set by the state. So um, I'm going to go through some of the resources. I'm going to stop presenting and kind of go through um, a few things. Can you see the website? Yeah. Okay. Great. So here's our um, here's our web page. It's uh, commerce.wa.gov. You could just put forward slash buildings, and it'll take you right here. So um, here you'll find the integrated document. So um, there, the link is in several spots here, but these are the main, um, um, I guess, topics that we chose to, to highlight in our homepage. So the integrated document, you're gonna have to fill out a form, but you'll get to download it for free. And this is what it looks like. And you can kind of go, go through and you'll see these in blue are what is WAC 19450. It's kind of um, what, um, commerce is added to it. So these are, um, again, it's 
an integration of WAC 99450 into the standard 100. And then um, other resources you'll find, this is uh, brand new. It's not live right now, but it will be at the end of the day. It's, it's um, the Clean Buildings Performance Standard Document Library. So essentially it will look like this. So the docu um, this library is pretty much, it's just to give you a better list of um, interpretations of the standard in these guides and tools and flowcharts. They can all be found here and searchable. And with everything, we are here for you. We have a customer support program where you can contact us, you can email us, you can call us. Um, also on our webpage, you'll find um, you'll find videos, you'll find tools, you'll find flowcharts. You could also find that in the document library. So let's uh, let me go back to presentation mode. Let me swap. Okay, great. So let's dive right into the questions and um, and go from there. Okay, question one. This is for you, Luke. Um, someone submitted and said, I'm not sure where to start beginning, uh, where to start bringing our building into compliance, or if we already are, how do I start this process? What tools are available to assist? Um, great question. Um, I would say one of the first things to do is to peruse our website for those tools and resources that may be of use. Annalyn just gave us a quick little uh, drive through the website. Hopefully that was um, clear enough so you can kind of navigate to the different pages within the website that may be useful for your projects and your questions. Um, beyond that, so the next step would be to um, confirm the accuracy and completeness of the data within the clean buildings portal for your building or buildings. So in order to do so, you will need a SAW account to access uh, the clean buildings portal, which is our database of covered commercial buildings for tier one. Um, there are instructions on how to create the SAW account and access the clean buildings portal with, uh, within our website. Anlen, do you mind um, showing the yes. viewers where to find that? So, go ahead, Luke. You could speak as I. Okay. As I, uh, just when you're ready to direct them, go ahead. So, on our page, you'll see it says Clean Buildings Portal. Um, you'll, you know, gives you some information whether if you have access, whether you have shared access. Um, shared access doesn't require a notification code. If you received a letter, you can access the portal that way as well. You'll see the link to the portal here. Um, there are video instructions on setting up a SAW, adding the service, and then first, um, first time access to the portal. And this Clean Buildings Portal User Guide is for first time access. And you'll see that on our page, it kind of goes through with a little screenshot um, if you need access or shared access because you're an authorized provider, you can go ahead and support um, submit a customer support ticket or email us and we'll give you um, the guidance and directions to, to do it. Right, great, thank you. So, um, you know, the commerce developed the data within the Clean Buildings portal from available resources such as tax assessor databases. Uh, it's not necessarily 100% um, accurate, so please reach out once you've reviewed the data in the portal for your buildings or buildings in question, uh, if you see any errors or things that need to be corrected. Um, next step, um, Anlen, do you want to show that flow chart again? I think what I'll do is kind of walk us through that flow chart in more detail and um, talk about a process in um, starting towards clean buildings compliance. So the first thing would be to um, you know, evaluate section Z4.1, which is 
the section of the integrated standard or the standard that outlines um, applicable exemptions. So determine whether your building is exempt would be a first step. Um, if your building is exempt, uh, it meets the requirements of any of the exemptions listed there. Uh, you can apply for exemption. We're hoping to get that application process open um, by the first of the year. Uh, if the exemption status is something that you need to apply for every cycle, um, building activities change over time. So it's something that you need to uh, actually make an application for. If that is um, approved, then no other requirements of the standard are needed. If uh, your building is not eligible for an exemption, I would start at um, educating yourself on what the uh, requirements of the energy management plan and the uh, operations and maintenance program of the standard are. That's going to be required of any covered tier one building, regardless of um, whether they're pursuing compliance under the EUI target performance metric or the investment criteria. Um, there are resources on our webpage. There's a webinar series that covers the energy management plan and the operations and maintenance program requirements. Again, they're also in the integrated standard. So that's something that can be done concurrently with um, uh, the pursuit of the performance metric that is determined to be uh, the path for your particular building. Uh, the operations and maintenance program is required to be implemented a uh, minimum of 12 months prior to the compliance date. So it's good to get started early. In addition, and implement an effective uh, uh, operations and maintenance program implement, implemented early, uh, will start to show uh, energy savings right away. And that may be useful in meeting the EUIT compliance path. So um, beyond the operations and maintenance program and the energy and management plan development, uh, the next step would be to uh, determine whether you can measure the EUI for the building. So this is what we call benchmarking. Not every building is gonna be able to be benchmarked. Um, some of the limitations are metering. If a building is not uh, metered independently from other buildings, uh, you will not be able to create an EUI for that building and thus you won't be able to pursue the uh, energy use intensity target performance metric of the standard. So determine that early is important to help direct you to the appropriate path for compliance. Um, if you can measure or EY, um, you would want to then set up an Energy Star Portfolio Manager account. Um, we have instructions on how to do so um, on our website. This um, Portfolio Manager account, it's an EPA uh, program. It's free. Uh, and it is the energy accounting system that's required for the standard. So it will create the EUI, so the benchmarking for the building, uh, and the weather normalized EUI, which is needed for, to show compliance with the EUIT performance metric of the standard. Um, if you cannot uh, measure EUI, uh, then you would want to start investigating the investment criteria paths in the standard. So the investment criteria path um, requires a ASHRAE level two energy audit, and then the implementation of all uh, energy efficiency measures um, that were uh, um, discovered during the energy audit that are deemed to be cost-effective in, in accordance with this investment criteria of Annex X in the standard. So benchmarking or 
uh, pursuing of the investment criteria path. There will be some buildings that can benchmark, but they may not be able to create an energy use intensity target for the building. In those cases, um, they would also need to pursue the investment criteria pathway. Let me, let's see, I have to move my screen a little bit. Okay. Um, so those are great starting points. Hopefully that clarifies and adds some value to that question. Um, and we can get into more depth of that question um, later on if we have more time or if there's any- um, There is one question that clarification I- Clarification uh, you need. Yeah, go ahead, Anka. Sure. Um, so can you please repeat the need for an ASHRAE level audit? Okay, so if you can't benchmark the building or you don't have an energy use intensity target for the building, uh, then you will need to pursue the investment criteria performance metric of the standard. Uh, so there's two performance metric paths to the standard. Uh, you need to do one or the other. So the investment criteria is the alternative to the EUIT target. Um, so the ASHRAE level two energy audit is a requirement of that investment criteria pathway. And the investment criteria pathway is all outlined in Annex X of the standard, as well as uh, section four of the standard. Okay, thanks Luke. Let's move on so that we can get through some of these questions. Uh, question two, what is the EUI target for multifamily buildings? greater versus less than 50,000 square feet. So I'll take this. So multifamily EUI targets, they're found in table 7-2A of the standard. So tier one buildings are not required to comply with um, either, um, I'm sorry. Multifamily buildings are not required to comply with either performance metric um, but they can participate in the early adopter incentive program. So the EUI target for multifamily buildings is 32, the west of the Cascades, and 33, the east of the Cascades. So tier two buildings um, will be required to implement an energy management plan and um, operation maintenance program by 2027 and benchmark with the possibility of performance metric in 2031. Annika, can you um, just give a brief um, um, share the eligibility of the incentive programs for multifamily buildings and um, well, buildings over 50,000 square feet? Sure. Yes. Thanks. So uh, for multifamily buildings, once again, to repeat that it, they are not required to um, meet the performance standard, but they are eligible to apply for the early adopter incentive program. So if they do apply, this does mean that you are um, you are your goal is to meet the performance standard. So buildings that are over 50,000 square feet, they have one utility that is participating in the early adopter incentive program, and they have an energy use intensity that is 15 above its target. So it's 15 above that 32 that would qualify you for this incentive program. If you meet all of these qualifications, then you can apply to the incentive program. We have that available on our website. Uh, we have a guidebook that outlines all the application documents and you do that within the portal. Um, once you've uploaded your application documents, we review it. And if you are, um, if you meet all of the requirements, then you could be eligible um, for an incentive that is 85 cents per square foot of gross floor area. Um, that is issued if a building meets its uh, building target. Um, I will pop the website, the, the link to the incentive program within the chat if you'd like to know more about this program or contact us um, for any additional information. Thanks. Thanks, Annika. And we do still have funds available, correct? We have lots of funds available. So if you are interested, please reach out and love to meet with you and chat with you. Thanks, Annika. So Let's move on to question three. What are the easiest and cheapest improvements that can be made in meeting building standards? So I'll take this one. Um, so it's difficult to answer this question with a blanket statement since all buildings are unique. It may be that a lighting upgrade uh, may be the low hanging fruit or that an implementation of an effective operation maintenance program may achieve some like impressive 
efficiency gains. So utility conservation programs traditionally focus on the most cost effective energy efficiency measures. I would definitely reach out to the utilities that serve your building and see what advice they can give you. So some utilities have developed clean building accelerator programs specifically developed to provide advice on compliance with the standard and um, most have incentive money um, available as well. So um, for a list that we, we have a, a small list um, or if you're aware of any that's not on the list, you could contact us and we can add it to the list, but it's under the support uh, and resources um, page. If you go to our um, clean buildings homepage and click on that and you'll see the list. So um, that's it. And next question. So what are some of the improvements being implemented in older buildings? Luke, you wanna take this one? Sure, yeah, you know, um, kind of to add on to what uh, Anna Lynn just spoke of uh, in the previous slide, you know, it's gonna be unique for various different buildings and, uh, you know, older buildings are typically going to be a little higher energy users, not just because the building envelope itself is uh, potentially um, less efficient, but uh, older systems within the building. So, you know, they will typically have um, more opportunities for energy savings. But lighting upgrades and HVAC equipment and controls are some of the more common energy efficiency upgrades made on on any building, but, um, you know, there may be better gains to be had in those or older buildings. Uh, to a lesser extent, we may see significant envelope improvements, um, you know, in, in increasing the um, insulation values of the building, window replacements, roof insulation, um, air sealing, etc. So where the systems and equipment and an older building are well beyond their useful life, consider upgrading these systems entirely to newer and more efficient technology. Maybe that wasn't available at the time that the building was, that those systems were uh, installed in the building. Uh, these are typically gonna be greater capital cost improvements for sure, but the added benefit of newer technology is providing increased uh, occupant comfort and reduced maintenance and operational costs. So. Again, consider reaching out to your utility provider to see what kind of advice they can give for your particular building. Awesome, thanks Luke. Next question, what can owners submit to satisfy the O&M, uh, which is the energy management plan, and um, I'm sorry, the EMP, which is the energy management plan, and O&M, which is the operations and maintenance program requirement for early compliance, which, it, which opens next July. So Commerce has not determined the reporting requirements for the CMP and the O&M programs yet. Um, Commerce will, will not be asking for submittal of the complete plans, um, but will develop re reporting requirements um, that is determined to effectively show compliance with these requirements. Any energy management plan or operations and maintenance program developed and implemented in accordance with the requirements of the standards should not have any trouble reporting such compliance. Um, Commerce is determining in an effective way to uh, report and document compliance with these requirements. You know, we want to have uh, reporting requirements that kind of get to the meat of things and show effective compliance, but it's not overburdened with. Um, you know, a, a paper trail from applicants. Um, so that will be coming here in the future. Awesome, thanks, Luke. So next question, can any building or group of buildings choose to comply via the investment criteria path, even if they have discrete metering? Or is there some level of proof that has to be provided to pursue the investment criteria? Yeah, any building can pursue the investment criteria of the standard. The intent of the investment criteria path is to provide an alternative performance metric for buildings unable to meet the EYT because metering is not configured appropriately. 
to accurately measure the building's UI, um, or when buildings do not have a target, or if the energy use intensity target cannot be met through cost-effective energy efficiency measures. So uh, you can choose to pursue the investment criteria path at any point, whether it's your building is metered uh, to create an EUI or not. Great, thanks, Luke. Um, question seven, are there any exemptions for historic buildings? Um, how about nonprofits? So there are, are not any exemptions to the standard for historic buildings or nonprofits. Uh, however, there are allowances that any documented historic building can opt out of implementing any energy efficiency measure deemed to be cost effective by the investment criteria of the standard if that measure compromises the historic integrity of the structure. So the building must have documentation of historic significance and the owner of a qualifying historic building shall have the plan for compliance evaluated by a qualified historic preservationist identifying any energy efficiency requirement that may compromise the historic integrity of the building or part of the building. Um, nonprofits may be eligible for a financial hardship exemption as defined in section Z4.1 of the standard. So you can take a look at that. Um, the financial hardship exemptions include um, that the building had arrears of property taxes or water wastewater charges. Um, the building has a court appointed receiver. The building is owned by a financial institution through default by a borrower. The building has been acquired in a deed in lieu of foreclosure. The building has senior mortgage subject to notice or default notice of default or the building owner has immediate and heavy financial need which cannot be satisfied from other reasonable available resources and which are caused by events that are beyond their control so that's a, that's the list as pretty much written or paraphrased in z4.1 of the standard uh, i would take a look at those see if that applies to your financial situation if it's a nonprofit um, or any other situation or um, Commerce is currently working on creating guidance for application of any of the exemption uh, uh, exemptions listed in Z4.1. So be looking for that prior to the end of the year, uh, be right prior to um, Commerce opening up application for exemption. And I don't know if you've noticed on our website, but Annalyn showed um, a page where you could sign up for our uh, Clean Buildings Bulletin. That is where we make announcements of any new tools, resources, or news related to the standard. Yes. And I'll show you that um, uh, again shortly. So next question, this is a long one. Um, so. I'm just gonna ask the question and not um, the comments after. So can you clarify that a building may be in compliance with the clean buildings performance standard within the 24 months, uh, 24 month window um, and not have a, a WNEUI, which is a weather normalized EUI less than the target at the time of submitting for compliance references, Annex Z 3.1 and 3.11. Yeah, so the weather normalized EUI shall be less than or equal to the target EUI measured from any consecutive 12 month period within two years prior to the compliance date or the date of application for early compliance. So the example given here represents the requirements of the standard um, appropriately. So as long as none of the 12 months of consecutive data is from any months beyond two years prior to the application date, they're good to go. So portfolio manager develops its EUIs from rolling annual data month by month. So just be sure the months included in the reported EUIs or whether normalized EUI 
are within that window and consecutive. So January through December of um, 2021 or April through um, March of 2022, make sure they're consecutive and it's within two years of the compliance date. So early compliance uh, begins uh, July 1st of 2023. So um, the EUI must be created from any 12 consecutive months um, up to July 1st of 2021, if that July 1st of 2023 is when you apply for early compliance. Hopefully that answers the question. Great, thanks Luke. Next question, if a building's EUI is higher than, uh, than the target, but all the elevated or evaluated EEMs have long paybacks, longer than the equipment life, then the building, then the building complies and will not get fined, correct? Yes, if the building has no cost-effective energy efficiency measures as identified within the ASHRAE level two energy audit and determined in accordance with the investment criteria of NXX, so that includes a life cycle cost analysis that really does the evaluation of what's cost effective. Um, the, the building can still gain compliance and avoid penalty, even if the weather normalized EUI is greater than the target. When the energy and management plan and the oper operations and maintenance program um, required by the standard are implemented, um, and all documentation is submitted and approved by Commerce prior to the compliance date. So in summary, do the ASHRAE level two energy audit, perform a life cycle cost analysis on all identified E energy efficiency measures. None of them are deemed to be cost effective. Um, implement that operations and maintenance program and energy management plan, submit all that documentation and you're good to go. Awesome, thanks Luke. Last question that was submitted uh, was, when will the exemption application process be open? So we're working on the exemption uh, process um, open by probably the end of the year, beginning of next year. So we're working with our developers to incorporate that into the clean buildings portal. So subscribe, like as Luke said, subscribe to our bulletin, or you can sign up and receive an email uh, when the guides are available and posted and the exemption application is available. And I'm gonna show you that real quick. And then we'll dive right into the questions from the chat. So let's see. So the exemption, sorry, <laughs> there you go. Exemption application contact list. Um, and I'll, I'll email this to um, those that registered this link. And you can subscribe by going to the homepage or any of the pages, and you'll see sign up for email updates and you can kind of go through that process. So Anika, do we have questions? Um, we sure do. All right, let's dive into those questions. All right, first question, what qualifies for pending demolition? How pending does it need to be? For example, if school district plans to replace a school on their next bond cycle, but it might be a 2026 bond vote with demolition in 2028. That's a good question. Um, I would say that, you know, specific to the um, Z, section Z4.1, we would ask for a, um, uh, a demolition permit to meet the qualification for that exemption. However, if a building has a plan to be demolished when, within a certain time frame, um, we may be able to verify that through um, not through the exemption process or possibly through the exemption process, but also through phased implementation. 
So the standard allows um, any energy efficiency measure that's deemed to be cost effective through the investment criteria of the standard uh, to delay um, implementation if that measure has not reached the end of its useful life. So I'm thinking um, that we could somehow include that um, demolition within the energy management plan of the standard um, and fit it in within the uh, intent of the standard that way. So I think there is some room for um, documentation and verification of those plans to allow uh, for um, compliance with the standard. But I would reach out to Commerce with that independent scenario and we can define the appropriate path uh, in that case. Thanks, Luke. Next question. What is the path forward if there is a building that has two different groups? The first floor is factory group F and the second floor is classified as B. So we're, we're looking at a mix. Uh, it sounds like we're looking at a scenario where we have um, a mix of an exempt space and a uh, space that is not exempt. Um, being the, the occupancy classification of B and the occupancy classification of F, which would be factory. So the F would uh, possibly be exempt according to Z4.1. So uh, the standard itself says if a building has a, a, a covered tier one building over 50,000 square feet, if more than 50% of the gross, gross floor area of the building is primarily used, uh, for manufacturing or industrial purposes, so factory group F or high hazard group H, then they would be exempt from the standard. So if they have two stories, um, assuming that the, the two floors equal, uh, you could be exempt if um, there is more than 50% of the gross floor area as primarily used for the manufacturing. If that's not clear enough, uh, please reach out with the specific scenario uh, to Commerce and uh, we'll determine sometimes, um, yeah, I, I don't, without really knowing the, the details of the scenario, um, I can't really comment too much further on that one. Thanks, Luke. This is not a question, I just wanted to highlight Devin posted. In addition to reaching out to utilities, the DES energy program is a great resource for public building owners. There is a website link there that you can select for that resource link. Next question. Thank, there, um, I just wanna say thanks Devin for giving that. I'm gonna post that into a, to our website. Thank you. Go ahead, Annika, sorry. No problem. Um, next question, is there a way to comply through the EUIT pathway using an Energy Star Portfolio Manager parent profile? Thinking of multi-owner buildings that will would likely maintain their own child profiles. Would like to maintain their own child profiles. Sorry about that. Yeah, there is a path forward for that. Um, we understand that buildings with multiple ownership may be difficult to um, seek, maybe less cost-effective to seek compliance as, as a whole building um, where multiple building owners have to work together to pursue compliance. So we are willing to uh, accept compliance at the parcel level um, in lieu of the building level, but we just need to be notified and we'll uh, make note of that within our portal and um, you know, make sure we have um, clear communication about the intent for compliance. 
And wouldn't the EUIT pathway using Energy Star Portfolio Manager require them to use Form C where they um, make sure that their meters are connected to the profile and usage data is uploaded and automated from utilities? Yeah, I mean, it would, it, it would be the same process of compliance using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, but we would figure out the most effective way to do it at the park level or the, the child level rather than the parent level, for those of you that understand that uh, nomenclature. Great, thanks. Next question, can you please point out where we could find recourse in regards to NGOs? Is it Z4.1? Yeah, Z4.1 is where all the exemptions are listed. Um, as I spoke of the financial um, hardship exemption, that would be exemption G of uh, Z4.1, 2G. Right. And That's again, cool. you know, okay. Commerce will come out with some specific uh, guidance for each of these exemptions here by the end of the year. And you're more than welcome to reach out individually with a question to Commerce and uh, we can speak further about it. Thanks. It would be helpful to address buildings with multi-exemption scenarios. Example, warehouse with some industrial, some unconditioned storage, et cetera. Would the threshold be conditioned office areas only? Yeah, so... Um... There is some complexity when a building may not um, comply through one single, if comply or be eligible for exemption through one single um, exemption listed in Z4.1. And it gets a little complicated when we talk specifically about the uh, exception C and D. So C is the sum of the building's gross floor area minus unconditioned or semi-heated spaces, semi-conditioned spaces um, is less than 50,000 square feet. And then the manufacturing exemption is based on percentage of the gross floor area. Uh, so the units don't quite align. Um, that's a great question, Catherine. And I think that's something that we're gonna have to develop within our uh, specific guidance that I've been speaking of that will come out on each of these exemptions um, prior to us um, opening up these um, exemption, exemption application process. Thanks, Luke. Next question. If a school district fails a bond and cannot fund any building improvements, could the financial hardship apply? Example, the building owner has an immediate and heavy financial need that cannot be satisfied from other resources available, resources that is caused by events that are beyond their control. Yeah, you know, um, Emily Salzberg uh, has answered this question very eloquently. I wish I could paraphrase her, but yes, there are, there will be a path. Um, if you know all reasonable attempts to get funding for compliance with the standard has uh, failed, and of course you know these uh, school districts are funded a little bit different differently and um, have different funding opportunities than the private sector. So, um, in a nutshell, if all reasonable measures have been um, pursued in order to uh, to achieve compliance or uh, funding then um, and failed, then it's likely that the financial hardship exemption uh, would be allowed. And again, this is information that will be coming out here prior to the end of the year, specific to each of these exemptions in Z4.1.
Thanks, Luke. Next, next question. Investment criteria is the only path that allows for delayed in EE implementation, right? Right. In order to um, delay or do phased implementation of any, any energy efficiency measure, uh, the investment criteria needs to be pursued, whether that's in, in pursuit of compliance through the EUIT or through um, uh, just meeting the uh, investment criteria performance metric of 75% of deemed savings or the um, uh, post commissioning protocols essentially for buildings that don't, that can't measure EUI. But uh, yes, uh, phase of implementation is part of conditional compliance. And in order to do conditional compliance, uh, a ASHRAE level two audit needs to be performed. Thanks. Next question. Most of the schools I'm thinking of are old, have equipment well beyond useful life, but don't want to replace millions in HVAC just to demolish a school in five years or so before end of useful life of new equipment. Devin, was there more to that question? I don't know if you want to come off mute for that. I'm sorry, that was just kind of a fall. I put that in when the question, oh, my previous question was being answered. It was just sort of, I was trying to provide some additional context, not an additional question. Thanks. Sure. Thanks, Devin. Was this okay. in connection to the demolition question where um, six years from now, Right. Uh, so the standard asks asks qualified persons like myself to use a life cycle cost assessment around the life cycle of the equipment, but sometimes the building life is scheduled to be shorter than the equipment life, and I'm not sure how to reconcile those two things for a client. Okay. Um, we're going to take this into consideration because for right now we're developing the guides, uh, the guidelines for exemption. And you said the demolition is um, scheduled for 2026. Is that what you said? Um, I, I just kind of pulled some some numbers, but I know, um, you know, I, I guess um, uh, I guess it doesn't hurt to maybe mention a name. I know I talked to you know Tacoma Public Schools and Highland School District, for example, and they've said, well, you know, we have these really old schools. We know the equipment is past the end of its useful life, but we just want to replace the whole building. Um, but we're not going to do that. You know, we have maybe a 2028 bond cycle that we've got those scheduled to be replaced on. But the compliance for those buildings, according to the program, is prior to that date. What are we supposed to do? Are we really supposed to reinvest in the HVAC equipment before that? And my answer to them is I don't know yet. <laughs> right. Yeah, you know, um, that's a great question, Devin, and it's a question we have heard before. And, uh, you know, it, although the rules do not specifically address this situation, um, Commerce is working to identify a pathway that meets the intent of the legislation and the rules for these certain situations. Um, and that's part of this. Um, not only the development of the guidance for each of these exemptions in Z4.1, but determining some pathway through the investment criteria and phased implementation when it comes to a whole building situa situation that you've mentioned. So, um, you know, uh, I'm not sure exactly if we're going to develop a work group for this, but. Um, if you want to reach out to us independently and and have a conversation about this, I bet the information that you have to share would be useful and us developing a, some guidelines here. Sure, I can reach out afterwards. Thanks. All right, this is the last question we have in the chat. Um, appreciate Devin's comment as building life may not align with equipment life at the point. At that point, a decision above about rebuilding may not be up for discussion yet, feels incredibly relevant to government facilities. So more of a, a comment than a question. Um, and that concludes the questions in the chat. Wait, no, but I think that I, I'm sorry, I added a question about the multifamily that um, at 11.45. Yes. Did, 
<laughs> yes, sorry, I skipped over that. So um, adding to the previous question regarding multifamily, are multifamily buildings not required to comply with the performance standard under tier one, but do under tier two? That's correct, Sarah. Um, with uh, tier one multifamily buildings, they do not need to comply with the current clean buildings performance standard. They are eligible for the early adopter incentive program. For tier two, as you know, that the law expanded to smaller buildings, including multifamily. Uh, for that, it's not uh, the initial phase it doesn't require a performance standard, but multifamily buildings, 20,000 square feet, and above would be required to benchmark, have um, an energy management plan and operations and maintenance plan. So uh, rulemaking for uh, the tier two um, has not started or hasn't been scheduled yet, but if you are interested in participating and we highly encourage everyone to participate in our um, rulemaking and stakeholder engagement, um, subscribe to our bulletin and we'll announce those meetings in the future. Is there anything yeah. else you'd like to add, Luke? Honestly? Yeah, Emily um, also had a question here I think that we didn't address. It was just clarification on parent profile questions. So if multi-owner buildings are on the same parcel and they are prepared to coordinate to comply together, can they use the parent um, profile to submit for compliance? And the answer is, is yes. Um, we it, it initially, you know, as the standard is written, you comply in the building level, but we have since um, decided to consider um, compliance on the parcel level as well. So it's either or. Sorry for missing the question. Um, Emily, we're going to go back to the tier two also. Um, if you got, if Luke or you have anything to add to what I said um, about that, and uh, go ahead. I was going to add that there is an incentive program for the tier two buildings. So um, tier two buildings, which multi-family is included in that, there is an incentive. Um, it's thirty cents per gross per gross square foot of floor area, and that excludes parking and unconditioned and semi-conditioned spaces. Um, and we have not developed the guidelines yet for that incentive program. Um, that will begin July 1st, 2025. We'll have guidelines for that well before, before the application process opens. Yep. So we're almost at time. I just wanted to share um, some upcoming events. We're going to have a Q&A session on October 13 on the um, life, cycle, life cycle cost analysis tool, which is used in the investment criteria uh, pathway. Um, during that session, we'll have Greg Rock, which is uh, the one of the authors of the tool there. So we don't have him quite often. So it's a treat to have him join us. And then October 25th, we'll have one. Um, it's just a webinar about meeting the EUIT compliance path. And on November 8th would be the investment criteria. And we'll have another general Q&A um, on this. And um, we thank you so much for joining us today. And this will be emailed to those who have registered. I will um, get the recordings out and posted, including the, um, the slide deck. Um, we used to provide a transcript, but we just speak so much about and with the answers. Um, just feel free to obviously email us um, or put in a customer support ticket and we'll um, provide you some answers to your questions. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate your participation. Have a great day.